at the Kekebeka Falls Provincial Park in Ontario, just west of Thunder Bay, a town that resides on the north shore of Lake Superior. The rain has been relentless, but I'm not letting it keep me down. As you'll see, all the rainfall has brought about more mosquitoes and soggier trails. Still, I'm not letting Mother Nature slow down my experience here. These exact trails that I'm hiking on were once used by the fur traders of hundreds of years ago to get around the falls here. Fur traders would portage around the falls to get upstream to go trapping or downstream to transport their furs on their way to markets in the eastern US and western Europe. I'm on the mountain portage trail, which is a perfect trail for families, pets, and people looking for something easy. If you keep going past that, there's a more advanced section of the trail that takes you deeper into the park. At the furthest point on that trail, you're rewarded with a look at the Little Falls, which is only accessible by this trail. So I took this hike on the uh, more difficult trail, the Little Falls Trail, two and a half kilometers. I walked over the mud and ponds and puddles just to prove that I'm not gonna let the rain keep me down. So I'm on my way to find some falls. I don't know if this is it or not. Oh yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Allow me to show you. It's like this is manufactured in like, you know, like for a for a mall fountain. of Kekebeka Falls begins in its geology. Long ago, this was all underwater and that create the shale that we're seeing that's being wiped away that has that kind of flat look to it. Shale is essentially what happens when sand and dirt fall to the bottom of a body of water and get compacted into layers. The shale here is very soft and easily breaks into pieces. It breaks off in layers because that's how they were laid down at the body of water that used to be here. There's also fossils at the bottom of many of the falls here. So why is there so much shale here? How much water could there have really been? It turns out it's the fault of something that was once much more abundant in North America, but is now going quite extinct. It's North America and even humanity's colder, older friends, the glaciers. Thousands of years ago, when the Ice Age was ending, Imagine a gigantic wall of ice, like Game of Thrones, basically on the horizon and straight up. This entire river valley, the walls on the sides and everything would have been just an enormous, gigantic river of glacial melt that ended up forming all of the Great Lakes, at least the ancestors of the Great Lakes, whatever was there before them, until the glaciers had melted into history. So when you see this, this isn't so much quite like a river that's only a few feet deep that just kind of kept going and going. It was, it was gigantic. The, the volumes of water that came through here just wasn't runoff from rainfall. There was a like, seemingly permanent supply of ice constantly feeding into the land around here. When the glaciers retreated, they turned into glacial meltwater and it would wash a lot of the land away with it. Much like a sandcastle in a wave on shore, that glacial meltwater would erode the land beneath it, dumping soil from today's Canada into today's United States. What was left afterward was a huge geological region of Canada and part of the U.S. known as the Canadian Shield. 
I've gone in much more detail about the Canadian Shield in a vlog on the North Shore. The Arrowhead region of Minnesota, where I'd spent the first eight episodes of the season, is but a mere portion of this pine tree empire. We've seen glaciers and the meltwater they make scrape the land clean of soil in other places too. An example of this is on an episode I made in season three, where I went through the Palouse region of southeastern Washington state. The Palouse region is one of the richest, most fertile lands in the world. The reason for this is again, because of glaciers. There was a ton of meltwater building in the Rockies with nowhere to go because glaciers were damming it in. Eventually, there was a glacial burst and all the meltwater escaped in what is called a cataclysmic flood. Floods like these are seemingly biblical. If you were standing in its path, the entire horizon would be nothing but an inescapable wave coming your way. The cataclysmic floods across Washington created the Scablands, a desolate region of the state where it's very difficult for plant life to thrive. The floods scraped all the soil from that region and dumped it into the Palouse region. On a much larger, slower scale, where I am today, the glaciers across central North America would dump Canadian soil into what is today's Great Plains of the United States. So you can imagine the Canadian Shield being a byproduct of that. There isn't much dirt or soil, topsoil, in this region, mostly because it had all basically been scraped away and then washed into the Great Plains, where we abuse the hell out of it in the United States by only growing corn and soy on it. <laughs> Because of the poor soil and its position so far north on the planet, the Canadian Shield is a tough place to make money, so not a lot of people live here. The region has very poor soil for farming, and most rivers are not deep enough for navigation. Any rivers that are deep enough are subject to freezing for half the year or more. Because the Canadian Shield runs right through the middle of Ontario, we can see how the formation cuts Canada in two. This divide also impacts the culture, economics, and politics of Canada. Eventually, as I cross the Canadian Shield, I'll find that the lands that I'm about to cross do not have many towns or people. The region is quite remote, with mostly hunting, fishing, mining, and ecotourism industries driving many of the small settlements in the region. You will witness me crossing the Canadian Shield and more in the coming episodes here on Two Wheels, One Compass. It's, it's Monday. There is nobody here. Ah, nature endorphins. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs>